to be with you again. It's been a number of uh, years that I've been uh, here with the family, and I'm so excited. Didn't know that this weekend that uh, Pastor would uh, have lost his mom, but it, it worked out that we were here, spent some time with him. Matter of fact, him and I were hanging out yesterday. Go ahead and hit that picture for me. Oh, wait a minute. That's not it. Go ahead and hit the next one. There we go. We, we hung out yesterday. We're just kind of uh, spending time together. It's what friends do, right? It's not about uh, judging each other or being hard on each other. It was sometimes just hanging with each other, and that's exactly what we did. We hung out and went to Yale and uh, was able to have some good food, and um, then we end up going to a movie. Him and Sandra got out of the house last night, and at one of her times she's got out, we went to uh, watch a movie yesterday called, uh, was it Boys in the Boat? Is that what it was, Pastor? Yeah, what he said. And uh, uh, it was a good movie about being on the same team, and so we're, we're kind of excited. This morning, I want to talk to you about uh, everyone communicates, few people connect. Now, uh, one of my mentors, uh, John Maxwell, he wrote a book on the subject. Uh, it's really not from his book today, but I wanted to talk to you about the power. I think a lot of Christians today, you know, understand that the Scripture says we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, with all our strength and to love your neighbors yourself. But the challenge is today is that there's a lot of people who are anxious. Have you noticed today in our culture, lots of people with anxiety, lots of people with fear, lots of people still, even though we made it all through the COVID years, there's still a lot of anxiety. And I think one of the reasons for it is that uh, we have a lot of people who I'm going to call uncongruent. What they say, what they believe, and what they do are three different things. And so as a believer, I, not only do I have to love the Lord, I've got to understand that I, I have to, that's a belief. God loves me, I love him, but if I believe that, I, it's going to change the way I communicate. It's going, to be, it's going to change the way I connect with people. It's going to change the way I communicate to people. So being congru congruent then has to do with you and I as a believer understanding that, that I can't live my life believing one thing, saying one thing, and doing another. And so how do we do that? How do we make the change? Now, some people will tell you, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't go there, don't say that. And, and, and that's just behavior modification, if you simply are just trying to clean up your act. The idea here is that God wants to transform you from the inside out, and he wants you to become a man or a woman of your word. He wants you to become a person who uh, has the transforming power of Jesus living on the inside of you that literally changes you. Now, John chapter 10 tells us that Jesus promised us the abundant life. But the challenge for a lot of Christians is everyone wants to walk on water, but few people get out of the boat. And what happens with our Christianity sometimes is we, we have a tendency to clean up the outside and leave the inside undone. And so one of the challenges that we have is we've got to spend time with God, what I call in prayer. Now, we all talk about prayer. I know there's prayer times at the church, and you pray, I pray, but... What does it really mean? Well, I think when you pray, you, God reveals himself to you, but he also reveals you to you. And it's been my experience since uh, uh, my new birth in Christ about 45 years ago as a teenager, I began to discover that when I'd spend time with God, God would reveal himself and he would also reveal my heart. And I got to be honest with you, some of the things that I found in my heart weren't so good. Matter of fact, I think I cried for three days when I, the Lord showed me how much pride was living on the inside of me. And if you're a prideful person, Listen, you can't even see your own pride. Everyone else notices it before you do. But when you spend time with God, God will show you he's not mad at you because pride's there. He wants to work with you and help you take the pride out. So Christians have to die to themselves. I had to die to my pride. If you want to do spiritual warfare in the kingdom, you have to do the opposite of what your flesh wants to do. So Jesus said the same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, and that power gives you the choice to choose to let your old nature, your old man, we call it in the New Testament, or his spirit lead you. Now, here's what I know. Most people are led by their five natural senses, right? Smell, taste, touch, hearing, seeing. But God wants us to be led by the spirit. The Bible says to as many as are led by the spirit, those are his children. So God's plan, listen, is to get you congruent, get you believing, get you uh, uh, acting and get you accomplishing all three of those areas of your life so that he can get you on solid ground. So words are not simply sounds caused by the air passing through your larynx. 
Uh, words have real power. As a matter of fact, it says this. God spoke the worlds into being by the power of his words. Hebrews chapter 11. And we are in his image in part because of the power we have, uh, we have with words. So the scripture makes it very clear. Our words have power, listen, to destroy and the power to build up. Now think about this. Christians want the abundant life. We want all that God has for us. But oftentimes it's working against us because the Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now think about that. I grew up in a home where my father was uh, very abusive with his words. And you could, work at, you, you could work your tail to the bone. He was never happy enough. He was never good. He, he'd, he'd cuss, he'd swear, he'd be little. And I, you realize that hurt people hurt people. So he grew up with a lot of deficit. I grew up then uh, having father deficits because I could never do good enough. No matter how hard I worked, no matter what I did, I always felt like it just wasn't good enough. And, and that began to translate into my relationship with God. But when I was 18, I accepted Christ. Jesus came into my life and began to work on me, changing me from the inside out, and he began to father me, and I began to literally rebel against my natural father, and I began to become congruent with my heavenly father. The writer of Proverbs tells us, the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Proverbs chapter 18, 21 says, are we using words to build people up or destroy them? Are they filled with hate or love, bitterness or blessing, Contem uh, complaining or compliments, lust or love, victory or defeat? Like tools, they can be used to help reach our goals or send us spiraling into deep depression. Psalms 19.14 says, Let the words of your mouth and the meditations of your heart be acceptable unto the Lord. If you want to find a pervert in our generation, all you got to do is listen because you hear him talk. You listen to someone who's bitter and angry and hateful, just listen how they talk, what they say to other people, how they treat other people. So the challenge that I had growing up is that I became 18. I led my dad to the Lord. My dad accepted Christ. My mom accepted Christ. And when they accepted Christ, what I found out is that they weren't perfect the same day. Which meant he said yes to Jesus, but when he'd get mad, his anger was still like 3.5 seconds, and he'd say lots of terrible things. And now I'm looking at it going, wait a minute, how does this happen? He accepted Jesus, and yet he's, his mouth is still filthy. Because here's what happened. Remember the story about Jesus? He's in Jerusalem. I've been there several times. I'd like to travel there. One of the places that we'll go is we'll go over to the Mount of Olives. And in the Mount of Olives, there's a cemetery there. And what they call a, a sepulcher is when you have this grave that's above ground. It's on the Mount, Mount of Olives. And sometimes the, the Jewish people will come and put little rocks in remembrance uh, and, and this sepulcher, if you will, uh, Jesus said as the Pharisees began to approach him when he was there, he said this. He said, you whitewash sepulchers. You clean the outside up, but inside you're still full of dead man's bones. Now you say, well, that was pretty rough, wasn't it? Jesus was kind of hard on the boys, right? Uh, he knew their hearts. And when you love somebody, when you realize how much God loves you, your goal is to love people. Sometimes we have to speak the truth in love. But how many of you know you can be right with your assessment, but you can be wrong on how to handle it? And God's plan is to teach his people, listen, everyone communicates, few people connect. Our mission is to connect with this world, even though we live in a crazy upside down world that says up is down and down is up. And God's plan is to bring people like you and I who understand the love of God for, for myself. He loves me, but he also loves you. He, every one of you are valuable to God. This is the answer for America. We're not divided by race. We're not divided by nation. We're, we're not divided by all the things that we're told that, because each person is valuable and God's intended that you and I would connect with each other so that we could communicate what's in our heart. This is why we need Jesus in our heart. Because he loves me, he forgives me, I can talk with people and understand that he loves and forgives them. Somebody say amen. amen. Right? So that, it, it's simple, but it's powerful because what happens is God's, the way God's going to reach the world is through you. And if you're 
you're not growing, you're not changing, you're not congruent. What's happening is, listen, there's that, we're all in a different place, but you and I need to be in small groups because small groups help rub you the right way by some people and they help rub you the wrong way by others. And that causes friction, which causes maturity. I'm going to learn how to deal with difficult people because I, people have been difficult with me, right? Or I can just retaliate and be difficult like they are. How many of you know that doesn't get us too far? I've been married 38 years this year, actually 39 in October, and uh, my wife tells me, she says, Dave, she said, you know what? I've never once thought of having a divorce with you. She said, murder every so often. <laughs> <laughs> and because I value communication, that's a joke, by the way, because I, because I value communication, I, and I, I study it, I like it, I want to be a good communicator, I want to really work at it, improve myself, sometimes she'll look at me and she'll roll her eyes and she'll say, okay, Mr. Communicator, because I may not be communicating so well that day. Furthermore, our words not only have the power to bring us death or life in this world, but in the next as well, Jesus said, but I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned, Matthew chapter 12. Words are so important that we're going to give an account of what we say when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is why we, we need to study the scriptures. It's why we need to memorize the scriptures. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable unto you, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Because what I need to do is I need to make sure it's not just what I'm saying out here. It's, 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 it's the overflow of my heart. So how do I get my heart to grow? How do I get to my... So here's, here's an example for me. I remember probably 40 years ago now, I was a young Christian and... Uh, uh, I asked my younger brother, he was probably five or six, to come spend the night and hang out with me. I had moved out already, and, and uh, I got busy with doing some stuff with some friends, and I said, hey, uh, Tony, I'm going to come pick you up, and you're going to come hang out with me, and uh, it, 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 I don't know what happened. I, I just lost it. I just forgot about it, and I, I realized my little brother sat on the front porch with his little, little suitcase for about six hours waiting for me, his big brother, to, to come pick him up. And I remember that breaking my heart. I, I remember it, 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 it caused me to never, ever want to do that again. I want, as a believer in Christ, I want to keep my word because the more I can be congruent, the more I keep my word, do what I say, live out my actions uh, not and my beliefs, it can make a difference in somebody. But if I'm going to say all this stuff and then I'm not going to live it, it's going to leave people with a bad taste in their mouth for the Lord. And so we need the transforming resurrection power of Jesus on the inside of us bringing change. The more time I spend with God, the more I become like him, the more he challenges me so that your yes be yes. Don't overpromise and underdevelop, underdeliver. And this is what businesses do all the time. It's what sometimes we do in church. Hey, pastor, you can use me. I'll be there and then not show up. It's like your actions and your words and your beliefs are not lining up. And therefore, it causes anxiety, causes fear and pressure. The apostle, the apostle Paul wrote this. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 in this passage, Paul's emphasizing the positive and the negative. The Greek word translated unwholesome means rotten or foul. It originally referred to rotten fruit and vegetables. Being like Christ means we don't use foul, dirty language. And for some reason, many people today think it's macho or liberating that they use vulgar humor and dirty jokes and foul language. But I'm not just picking on our language. I'm saying this stuff is coming out of our hearts. So that's necessary that we spend time with God in prayer. God reveals how magnificent he is. The Bible says magnify the Lord. What does that mean? Make him bigger than all my fears, bigger than all my problems. And then when he reveals my, me to me, I can begin to say that is unbecoming. I'm going to resist that. I'm going to die to that. And I want to do what you do, Jesus. And you begin to discover that's how you grow out of that immaturity. This is why we need to be in small groups. Every believer needs to have some people. You call them small groups program-wise. I'm talking about being in real groups with real people 
like I am with your pastor. We've been hanging out for 20 years. We hold each other accountable. We'll speak to each other. You know, uh, he, 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 right now he's grieving his, the, his mom, and, and it's like, listen, I, I'm just going to listen. We're just going to have some fun this week. I'm not gonna, we're not going to get into some theological debate. We're, we're, what we're going to do is let's hang together because that's what he needs right now. He doesn't need a, for me to come and try to teach him something. He, we're friends. You hear what I'm saying? And I think sometimes what happens is as Christians, we try to be right all the time. After being married almost 39 years, I don't care about being right anymore. I'd rather have peace in my, ha- in my home. So the first thing I want you to see is that Colossians mentions this too. It says, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. So rather than being judgmental, what I'm going to say is you're going to gather with people and some of them are going to have a foul mouth. Some are going to say things and, and uh, uh, you know, today, even if you compliment somebody, they think you're trying to, you know, pick them up or something. Hey, you have a beautiful smile. Are you hitting on me? I'm like, no. Man, I... you, you need to know that God's looking for you and I to say the right things not the wrong things. My focus isn't, let's not do this and not do this and not do this and not do this. It is, how can I speak life? And what more can I say? And what more can I do to connect with you so that I can influence you for Christ? Leadership in Christ's body is influence. So I want to gain my influence. And the more influence I have, it means you trust me. Now, in the workforce, they tell you that people are going to be attracted to you who they trust and like. But it's true in the body of Christ. Who do you trust and who do you like? And most times if you trust them, it's because what they say, they follow through on. There's a remarkable parallel in Ephesians chapter 4 about lying, Ephesians 4.28, stealing, and Ephesians 4.29, unwholesome talk. In each case, Paul is to be a a blessing to those whom we have in daily contact. He's challenging us. Paul's emphasizing that Merely refraining from telling lies, stealing, and unwholesome talk is not enough. The truth is that Christianity is not a mere don't religion. As followers of Christ, we should emulate the example of Jesus and be filled with grace. And the multitudes were amazed. When Jesus walked among the people, the Bible says they were amazed how he walked in authority. When you and I mature, we become comfortable in our own skin. We quit competing and comparing ourselves with other people. We begin to die to our insecurities, and so I'm not trying to impress you. I'm trying to add value to you today, because being here today isn't about me. It's about you. You are God's precious love children, and the ministry that's for you is not above you. It's to serve you, to help you grow. And if we add value to you, guess what? When you get that understanding of how valuable you are to God, then you start treating others like they're more valuable. Jesus reminds us of the words that we speak are actually the overflow of our hearts in Matthew chapter 12. When one becomes a Christian, there is an expectancy that a change of speech follows because living for Christ makes the difference. In, it's one, in one's choice of words, the sinner's mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. And Romans chapter 3 says, but when we turn our lives over to Christ, we gladly confess that Jesus is Lord. Romans chapter 10, 9, and 10 says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. Saved from what? Saved from our sins. So although he forgives all our sins, the Bible teaches us that we have an old nature. Now, Jesus deals with it by going to the cross, dying for your sins, forgiving you. But there's a lot of people who are Christians who refuse to believe that they're forgiven. How many, how many did something last month that, that was bad and you asked God to forgive you about it? Anybody? Now, are, did you receive his forgiveness? Did you believe his forgiveness? Did you act out the forgiveness? Or do you still believe that you're messed up from last month? No, we're, the, the goal here is not to stay perfect. The goal is to stay forgiven. <coughs> Excuse me. The more I'm forgiven the more I'm going to act like I'm forgiven. Watch this. And the more I'm going to extend forgiveness to other people. 
So it now leads to not only, you know, my words and my behavior, but now it leads to my actions. And I want to just talk to you a little bit about some practical communication studies I've had. When I was in college, I, I studied communication, and, and they teach there that there are forms of non-listening, and this is what happens. So when, you, when I say one of these and you know somebody that's operating in this, I want you to say, oh my. Here's the first one. These are forms of non-listening, and it's what we call pseudo-listening. When we pretend to listen, we appear to be attentive, but really our minds are someplace else. Have you ever talked with somebody, and when you were talking with them, you know they're not really listening? There's nothing more frustrating to me, because I listen to people all the time, listen to their problems, listen to their issues, and then I get ready finally to get up and tell, start telling them about my hurts and my hang-ups and my bad habits and whatever it is, and they go, oh, yeah, you're, you know, you're a pastor. It, I just shut down, and I go, I tried. No one, no one will be there to listen. And a lot of times, pseudo-listening is when we're trying to put on a, a front that we're we're listening when we're really not. We engage in pseudo-listening when we should appear conscientious, but we really aren't interested. Can anybody relate to that one? Did you ever try talking to your husband when he's looking at his cell phone? Did you ever try talking to your husband on Super Bowl day when he says, pass the, pass the chips and the salsa, and you're trying to have a serious conversation? He's not listening. All that because what happens is when we don't do what God asks us to do, when we're not congruent, our natural abilities have a way of saying, I want you to think I'm listening, but I'm not. I'm someplace else. Now I'm not connecting like I need to. And there's plenty of husbands and wives sleeping in the same bed who roll over and are both lonely because they haven't connected all day. Everyone communicates. Few people connect. Number two, everybody say monopolizing. Monopolizing is hogging the stage by continually focused communication on ourselves instead of the person that we're talking to. Do you ever talk with somebody and they just go on and on and on and on and on? Yeah, 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 yeah. And you know, you start getting fatigued, right? You're like, oh my gosh, how long are they going to... You wouldn't say that, but that's what you're thinking in your head. I had a friend of mine used to call me and want to talk and he'd just talk and talk and talk. I mean, if I let him, he'd talk for two hours. And so, of course, what I'd do is I'd say, you know what? I'd put it on speakerphone, and I'd, I'd wash my windows. <laughs> I'd study a book, you know. I'd, 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 I'd do 15 other things, and, and I'd go, uh-huh, yeah. And I'd just go walk away, wash more windows, and I'm trying to get all this done. And one day, he, he fooled me. He said something really stupid. He's like, yabba dabba do. <laughs> like, what's that? Like Fred Flintstone? But I didn't hear it. I, wasn't, I didn't care what it was. He said... And he said, did you hear that? I go, oh, yeah, 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 I heard that. And he caught me. And basically what I was saying is there's two things that happen there. Number one, if I want a good relationship with somebody, i got to create some healthy boundaries. I was trying to be conscientious and listen to you, but you went on for too long and I didn't hear a word you were saying. I'll tell you what, i got 30 minutes to talk to you today. If you want those 30 minutes, I'll focus. But I'm not going to pretend to listen to them for 30, you know, just... He's, it's not a good boundary for him. I can't. I don't have two hours to give to somebody who just wants to continually talk about themselves and doesn't want to take the counsel that I'm giving him. Two tactics are typical for monopolizers. One, it's conversational rerouting. You know, they're, they're talking about themselves and you try to get something in and then they just reroute it and come back to themselves again. You know people like that? The second is interrupting to divert attention to ourselves. So sometimes I find that there's certain people who will literally interrupt me when I'm trying to share my heart, and they'll make it all about themselves again. You go, oh, okay, go ahead. I just got to take it. The next one is selective listening. Selective listening involves focusing on a particular part of communication. We listen selectively when we screen out parts of a message that don't interest us or with which we disagree. Know what I'm talking about? You're having a conversation with somebody and says, well, I like President Trump. <laughs> or I like President Biden. As soon as they say Biden or Trump, you're gone. You're like, forget that. This guy's an idiot. <laughs> and so we disconnect. And we say, you know what? 
you're an idiot. I don't, I'll pretend I'm listening again, but I don't really want to talk to you. And then here's another one. You'll like this one. Defensive listening. You know of anybody like this? Defensive listening involves perceiving personal attacks, criticism, or hostile undertones in communication when none was intended. Anybody on social media at all? Anybody ever get a text? And you lost your mind? And what you thought they meant had nothing to do with what they really said? It happens all the time. Teenagers have so much drama with this. You go, what did they say? Well, it was in capital letters. <laughs> I'm like, in my generation, a capital letter was a capital letter. It, wasn't, it didn't mean I'm screaming at you. So all of a sudden, you begin to recognize there's so many things that are keeping us from really connecting. Understanding that you're loved by God, you're forgiven by God, and God wants you to connect with other people. So here's the idea. We've got to develop skills, and that's why I'm talking about these forms of non-listening, because if we're really going to reach this generation with the gospel, I've got to find ways to connect. Here's one. We call it ambushing in communication. Ambushing is listening carefully for the purpose of attacking the people that's speaking. Ambushing involves very careful listening, but it isn't motivated by interest in somebody else. Instead, ambushers listen intently to gather ammunition in which they use to attack the speaker. They don't mind bending or even distorting what you say in order to advance their own combative goals. So here's what I know when it comes to churches. And I, I know your church isn't like this, but the devil is doing everything he can to get you mad at your pastor and your leader of church, at, at church. Because if you can come in here and you're defensive already because you're mad at them because you think they're a jerk because they don't whatever, you have a very difficult time receiving what God's saying through them. Now listen, I understand that God can use a donkey to speak. So I, I'm not saying that I'm any special gift. I, what I'm saying is, is that if you get mad at me, you come up today and say, did you see that shirt that guy had on? What an idiot he is then you'll probably leave today not getting anything or missing everything that I've tried to say. But if, because I like your pastor and I compliment him and I like him, I like his family, you think, you know, he likes my pastor, I'll give him a shot. And while you're sitting there, the Holy Spirit begins speaking in your ear because your defenses are down and you can receive. See, when you get angry and defensive and mad, many times it's, you're keeping out what God's trying to bring in. Here's another one. I'll close with this. Literal listening. Literal listening involves listening to only the content level of meaning and ignoring the relationship level of meaning. Okay, so now what, I'm, what we're saying here is you're literal is you're literally taking every word they say. My kids would do this sometimes. Dad, you said, and, the, and they're being literal with me. They're not being relational. Relational, there's a little grace there. You say something, you know, if, if we're talking in the car yesterday and he mentions, you know, I'm... I'm I'm hurting and I'm just feeling bad about my mom. And I go, you can't hurt. The Bible says you better be, be at love. You, you, you know what I mean? You, you try to give them religious stuff. Relational meaning was, I'm just going to listen to them and let them talk. I'm not trying to correct them. I'm not trying to hold them to some standard. What I want to do is just be a friend right now. So that's the difference between relational and literal. And then all communication includes both content or literal meaning and relational meaning that pertains to the power, responsiveness, and liking between individuals. Listen to this. When we listen only literally, we are insensitive to others' feelings and to our connection with them. So what am I trying to say today? I'm trying to say that you as a believer in Jesus, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love others as yourself, requires, listen, that we develop skills, communication skills. Do you ever try to go out with somebody and they're just trying to learn to witness to somebody? I had a new friend, just got saved, and he's a believer. I take him to the restaurant, and he decides that he's going to be bold in prayer and pray over his salad, and here's his prayer, brand new Christian. Lord, cover my salad with the blood of Jesus. I'm like, wow. That's, that's a little rough. I mean, the, the, literally, the waitress came over and says, 
There's blood on your salad? What? I understood the intent. His intent was, yes, we wouldn't want to cover all our food with the blood of Jesus. But that was a relational level. What he really said in front of strangers and unbelievers was something that seemed weird and odd to them at the moment. You get what I'm saying? But we're, we're, we're a group of people in the church. The church is like the Old Testament ark. We're gathered, we're being gathered. Get into the ark, get in while it's time. Be part of a small group. Rub each other the right way, rub each other the wrong way. Let's learn that everyone's on a different journey. Some of you have tempers right now, I guarantee you, that go from zero in three seconds, you, you, can, you can be right there. Well, that's okay. Because I've been doing this for a while and it'll take a lot to get underneath my skin. So I can tolerate that. And then you get to tolerate me because you think, well, you're just always happy. And you, you just tick me off. Right? You ever find some people like that? There's always nice, always saying nice things. You go, oh, that must be fake. <laughs> you go, stop. Now, you can push me if you want to get me mad. Push me long enough. Watch. Right? But the challenge it is God's wanting us to be mindful. You got to check this out. He's wanting us to learn to be mindful, suspend judgment, understanding other people have different perspectives. I can love Biden supporters. I really can. I can pray for them. I can pray for the president. I can, I hate to say it, I can pray for Trump supporters. But I'm just telling you right now, you see our culture right now, you just say those names and it invokes emotion. And you start forgetting that all people are valuable and you think only one side is valuable. When God says, all my people are valuable, I will love all my people. I will forgive people. And God's saying, I need you to communicate that same thing. Be mindful, suspend judgment, understand the other's perspectives, express support for each other, listen to discriminate. In some situations, we listen to make fine discriminations in sound in order to draw valid conclusions. Moms are the greatest at this. Their baby can cry. Ah! And mom goes, oh, no, no, he's fine. He's just... And other people would panic. Did he fall? Did he break his nose? What happened, right? You, you, you've got to pick things up. There's a, there's a relational level of connection that, that you want to make sure that you're believing the best. The Bible says believe the best about each other. That's what love does. But we always come to the wrong conclusion first. Then have to back away from it. Make a lot of story short. James chapter 2, verse 3 says, My brethren, let not many of you be teachers knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. If we all stumble in many ways, if anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man, also able to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member it boasts of great things. Can I say to you this Super Bowl Sunday here in Connecticut that, that God wants us to be disciples who learn to communicate better, that we spend time with God allowing him to change us from the inside out, that most of the stuff we're hearing other people say is a reflection of what's going on in their heart. And if we'll learn to repent, turn from that and say, I'm gonna do the right thing, Repent literally means I'm going to turn away from my anger. And spiritual warfare really is this, doing the opposite of what your flesh wants to do. My flesh wants to smack some people in the face. <laughs> but my spirit says they're one of God's children. Don't you dare pray for them. Love them. And help them by loving them see that that's not the best way of handling it. Does that make sense? Would you bow your heads with me? If you're here today, and maybe you're just uh, passing through, maybe you're visiting, maybe you're looking for a church home. This is a great church, full of problems, full of broken people, full of people who say wrong stuff, but nonetheless committed to God and want to grow and change. If you want to give your heart to Christ, you want to be forgiven of your sins, today's a great day to throw up your hand and say, I surrender I'm going to go in the opposite direction. When I count to three, I'm going to ask that you would raise your hand and say yes if you want to invite Jesus to come inside you, change you from the inside out. Deal with the anger. Deal with the hurt. Deal with the problems so you become more like Jesus. When I count to three, I'm going to ask that you put your hand up. 
and say, yes, I received Jesus. One, two, three. Put your hand up real quickly. Say, that's me, Pastor. Hands all over this room. I want you to lead you in a prayer. Would you please say this after me? Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I believe you died on the cross and you rose again to give me a new life. I receive you right now. Can we thank the Lord for all those that raised their hands this morning to receive the Lord? Congratulations. Now, when a person says yes to God, what they need to do now is get into a small group, get into a church, and begin to let them rub you the right way and the wrong way so that you can grow and mature. Now, how many believers are here this morning and say, there's room to improve your communication skills? Anybody here beside me? I'm going to pray for you. Father, would you come now sending the Holy Spirit to reveal yourself to us, reveal us to us so that we'll be willing to grow and change that we'll realize just as you created the heavens and the earth, you spoke it with words that we speak life over our children. We speak life over our spouses. We speak life over our community. That, Lord, we will learn to connect, not just communicate. Father, thank you for helping us not be uh, people who just dump information, but learn to connect with you and connect with each other. In Jesus' name.